Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 13 of LTech 676. Quiet. I want to start, like always, reflecting on Critical Reflection 8, Giving Voice. In general, I really appreciated your effort on this assignment. So let's recap some of the interesting connections you folks made in your reflections. Tamara started us off by connecting the concept of personhood to diversity, and she made strong connections to the readings, touching upon concepts such as disruptive fixation, moral reformers, algorithmic discrimination, class inequities, and networks of knowledge. She also noted two common stereotypes of disability, the burden on society stereotype and the triumph over tragedy stereotype, both of which are exaggerated or exacerbated by technology. Now, Samantha connected to the running illustrated metaphor of equality versus equity. She also touched upon the role nomenclature plays in how we talk about one another and the tools we use and expect others to use. She also notes that recent novels and TV shows in popular culture feature characters with disabilities, such as ABC shows Speechless. This, of course, is evidence of representing people with disabilities more fully, but is also fraught with its own limitations and challenges. Now, Jean-Pierre focused on assumptions around race, culture, and gender that are built into synthetic speech technologies, such as the ones Alper talked about in her book. JP also linked back to the idea that societal problems influence technology use, adaptation, and innovation in forceful ways. And we're seeing those societal problems play out in the adoption and creation of the synthetic speech technologies. Finally, Bin Bin began with a nice recap of recent education reform efforts in the U.S. She then summarizes the problems, solutions, technologies, and inequalities covered in Alper's chapters 2 and 7. She then did a deep dive into the backgrounds of some of the various technologies mentioned by Alper, Voice ID, Proloquo to Go, and Tap to Talk. And she ended by reflecting on multiple quotes from Alper and exploring the ethics of so-called GM voices, or genetically modified voices. Again, excellent critical reflections by all of you. I really enjoyed the many connections you're making and the various resources and linkages that you're drawing upon. Now with that, I want to say congratulations. Believe it or not, you've now completed all of the critical reflections and concept maps for LTech 676. The only remaining assignment will be the final paper, which I will formally assign next week. Now, before we get into this week's material, I did want to point out this emoji version of the hype cycle. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen it before, but just in case you haven't, here is the emoji version of Gartner's hype cycle. I think this is really clever and wanted to share it with you because it's really funny. All right, everyone, let's move on. In today's session, we're going to wrap up theme four by focusing on Merrill Alper's book, Giving Voice. So let's get started. We'll begin by spending a little bit of time talking about augmentative and alternative communication. And of course, this is part of what we should know as educators thinking about the role of educational technology in education and society. So what is meant by augmentative and alternative communication technologies? Well, first, let's start by defining the category as communication systems, strategies, and tools that replace or supplement natural speech. These systems, strategies, and tools support people who have difficulties communicating using speech. Augmentative communication is when people supplement or add to their speech with something such as sign symbols or a letterboard in order to make their message clearer for the listener. In contrast, alternative communication is for people who are not able to speak or their speech is not understandable even when they add something to it. In these cases, they need a different way to communicate. So what are the benefits of augmentative and alternative communication? 
In general, when a person cannot speak, giving them a tool or a strategy to communicate their thoughts, ideas, and desires is really a powerful form of enabling their communication. Some of the benefits made possible by AAC's system strategies and tools include stronger friendships and deeper relationships, increased autonomy and decision-making, increased independence, more respect from others, more employment and volunteer opportunities, as well as improved physical and mental health. Now let's take a look at some of the technologies related to augmentative and alternative communication. One of the examples referenced in Alper's book, of course, is Proloquo, or Proloquo for Text, which you can see here. Proloquo for Text is an app for Apple's iOS and their iPad technology. This particular software is developed by Assistive Wear, and you can see their description of the product on the left. In general, this software is a way of using text to create speech. Off to the right-hand side, you can see the interface and how the software uses sentence prediction. Users can actually type in words, and they also have quick talk buttons to help users find quick answers to things. Importantly, this is software that's designed for people who can already write. Interestingly, this app is pretty expensive. It currently sells for $119. Now, Assistiveware creates another product that is a symbol-based AAC. This is for people who don't necessarily have language skills yet. This particular app we're seeing now is called Proloquo to Go, and it's symbol-based, meaning users don't have to be able to read and write. They can use the pictures on the interface in order to create sentences and to communicate with others. You can see here, if you look closely at the screenshot, the squares or cards that are in orange are pronouns such as I or you, and the pink cards are verbs such as do or want. The ones in green are prepositions such as to or in or out. Using these cards, individuals can type out sentences and the application will then synthesize those sentences into speech. So let's take a look at an example of an individual named Ruby and how she has used and benefited from Proloquo to go. I first met Ruby two years ago when she started school, very much in her own bubble. She was the youngest premature baby in England she was described to me as a very challenging case. I want computer, please. Mrs. Holly Green. Good girl. Since Ruby has had the iPad, her behaviour has improved 95%. I would be getting hit um, 20, 30 times a day, um, where now is I've worked all day today and she doesn't hit me at all. The iPad and the software is allowing her to unlock her communication and, and communicate with me. And on a daily basis, she absolutely amazes me. So you might be thinking, well, why are we talking about AACs? Of course, this has to do with equity in education, which has been one of our primary topics this semester. And we know that there are two dimensions to equity and education. First, we have the fairness dimension, ensuring that personal and social circumstances are not obstacles to achieving educational potential. And obviously, people like Ruby, who can't communicate normally, or at least struggle to, have personal circumstances that should not be an obstacle to her achieving her educational potential. The second dimension of equity is inclusion, which is concerned with ensuring a basic minimum standard of education for all members of society. And we've already talked about that technology has a role and in enabling fairness and inclusion. Now let's take a look at some of Alper's findings in giving voice. So what did she set out to do? Well, she's really talking about looking at technology through the lens of disability. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about the technology hype cycle as defined by Gartner. I mention this because I would argue that Alper's in-depth qualitative analysis is sort of an antidote to the peaks and valleys documented in the technology hype cycle. Her work is a counterbalance to the peak of inflated expectations and the trough of a disillusionment. Alper is really going much slower. She's going deeper and trying to give us a more nuanced analysis of the role of communication technologies as seen through the lens of disability. 
ability. So her book really centers on the social implications of communication technologies that purport to give voice to the voiceless. And in her book, she explores the very meanings of the phrase giving voice to the voiceless through the critical lens of disability. Alpert notes that too many stories focus on objects, the technologies, and not the people. And this happens, she claims, when mass media frame mobile communication technologies as a medium for voice, a tool for finding voice, and a metaphoric key for freeing a caged voice. She really frowns upon the media's framing of mobile communication technologies in these ways. Why? Well, she argues that such language focuses on the objects, the technologies, and not the people themselves. And as a result, this leads to oversimplification that really leaves people out of the equation. And that's really dangerous when thinking about equity in education. She also notes that technological tools may selectively amplify voices within and across various publics and audiences, and that their existence does not automatically call into question a status quo of structural inequality. In other words, she recognizes these tools can amplify voices in different spaces, but that there's a danger that the mere existence of such technologies with a few select voices doesn't necessarily call into question the structural inequalities that we've been talking about this semester. What Alper's book is doing is questioning utopian visions of technology, and that's important to us in our thinking about the dimension dimensions of equity. The question or questions that Alper sets out to answer is, how do parents manage their child's use of hardware and software, as well as the other communication technologies? And how do they incorporate media into their family's daily life, at home, on the go, and in the community? That's really what she wanted to get to know. She was sick of headlines and mass media oversimplification. So what are some of the things that she found? Well, she found that parents were united by the label of special needs parents parents, but at the same time they were divided by social class. She also found that technology itself did not give voice, and that the term voice is an overused and imprecise metaphor, one that abstracts, obscures, and oversimplifies the human experience of disability. So as folks interested in the role of educational technology in education, we have to keep in mind that using the word voice might obscure or oversimplify the human experience experience in relation to fairness and inclusion. In addition, Alper noted that the parents' ability to mobilize social, economic, and cultural capital shaped the extent to which their children could not only speak, but also be heard. In other words, there were social, economic, and cultural factors that influenced whether or not the children really embraced, leveraged, and benefited from the existence of different hardware and software technologies. The mere existence of the tools didn't necessarily give them voice and or allow them to be heard. Finally, Alper notes that mobile technologies largely thought to universally empower people by giving voice to the voiceless, particularly individuals with disabilities, are still subject to disabling structural inequalities, ones that we often do not hear about, and as a result are assumed not to exist. Again, Alper is pointing out that mobile technologies are not immune to the disabling structural inequalities that we already know exist. Now, Alper ends her book by focusing on a few recommendations for technology develop developers. And I think these recommendations are important and things that we, the next generation of educational technology designers, developers, and implementers should be keeping in mind. Her first recommendation has to do with voice and diversity. She argues there needs to be improvement in the design of synthetic speech technologies. Currently, they're full of assumptions about race, culture, and gender that are built into these existing technologies. In short, non-white and female voices are largely silenced through synthetic speech systems. So Alper really challenges us to expand the range of human voices embedded in these machines. Secondly, Alper points out that there are major issues related to data and privacy. She notes that high-tech AAC devices keep track of everything a person says 
images, but in an untraditional way because they actually store digital records of the symbols or text converted into speech output. And because of this, individuals who use these devices have a unique perspective on important societal issues like data surveillance, counter surveillance, and personal privacy. And importantly, she notes that disabled individuals are not passively given voices by able-bodied individuals. Instead, they are actively taking part in making voices despite structural inequality. And therefore, any decisions about their own assistive technologies should include them. In other words, they need to be part of the conversation. Her third recommendation is related to talking machines and listening devices. She notes rightfully that there's a lot of valid anxiety about privacy and security issues raised by the Internet of Things. These debates should be contextualized within the larger history of augmentative and alternative communication systems, as these technologies innately involved the practice of speaking through and being in conversation with objects. So it's not like these technologies, these talking and listening machines, are new just because we suddenly have Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistants. Alper wants to remind us that there's a rich history that we should be drawing on, and she points out that artificially intelligent talking toys and their intersections with AAC might also influence the design of educational technologies more broadly. Her fourth and last recommendation has to do with the tone of synthetic speech, and she notes that most voices in AAC systems have a neutral reading style which does not reflect the full span of human expression through voice. Importantly, she believes that tone of voice is not secondary or optional, but essential for being understood by others. For this reason, there's a need for more creative human-centered design research into how tone of voice and AAC devices might be expanded. She extends this argument to thinking about the role of emoji and emoticons in relaying emotion exclusively through visual communication. She asks, what should emoji actually sound like in in different languages and spoken through synthetic speech systems. It's questions like these that we need to be thinking about as we keep an eye on and develop the future of educational technologies if we're ever going to come around to true fairness and inclusion in education. Okay, everyone, that's a lot to digest and we're out of time for today. Have a great week and I'll see you in Canvas.